Hello. Hello. How's it going? Happy Friday. TGIF, everybody. <laughs> no. I'm I'm super happy that it's Friday. We were just talking about the fact that mm -hmm. we're happy. We're like, let's go weekend. Do you have any like cool weekend plans? Yeah, sleep. <laughs> <laughs> that is a cool weekend plan. I'm here for it. <laughs> Same Same How so, you doing? I'm doing good. I'm doing really good. Like, I feel like I had a productive week. I always like when it's productive, but I am looking forward to sleep as well. I might watch the Bob Marley movie, but that's about it. All right. So for people who tuned in and you're like, what is this? This is my first time tuning in. Um, this is a weekly stream hosted by TBD, um, which is Block's business unit. And basically every Friday we talk to different um, leaders in the software, um, not software, sorry, the self-sovereign identity industry. And uh, today we have a really interesting guest um, who actually is building a I'm, I don't know if he would want to call it this. He could describe it how he would, but I've tried it out and it reminds me of ChatGPT. So I'm thinking of it as like ChatGPT built on Web5. Um, and I'll, I'll let him explain more, but I think we can bring him up on stage. Yep. Great. Hey, Simon, how's it going? Hi, guys. Thanks Hi. for uh, inviting me in. Super oh. excited to talk a little bit with you guys about personal AI. Of course. I'm super excited too. And before we jump into who you are, what you're doing, what you're up to, I always like to start with like a little bit of an interesting, fun question for everyone. Um, so my question to y'all is OpenAI recently released, I think it's called Sora. I don't know how you would pronounce it, S-O-R-A or something like that. Sora, yeah. Sora, okay, perfect. And basically you can put, you can like take text and turn it into videos. How do you guys feel about that? Are you like, this is cool? You're like, this is concerning or weird? I don't know, I'm curious. <laughs> I think, yeah, uh, I, yeah, yeah, please go ahead, Simon. <laughs> no, I think, I think it's super cool. And I think OpenAI I have been like really great at pushing the boundaries with their, you know, scaling approach to machine learning and, and LLMs. But yeah, so I, I love the research they're doing. Maybe I'm a little bit more skeptical about their consumer product side of things, but I'm sure we will talk more about that. Yeah, I think it's very fascinating to see like how they're pushing the limits, um, but it's scary to see the product of it and what, you know, the world could make of it. Cause it's like, <laughs> this is too much power, I guess. <laughs> Yes. It's, it's really exciting to see, to be honest. Be scary or excited? Um, I feel mixed, a mixture, right? Like I love like the like y'all are saying, like the technology behind AI is like mind blowing. It's like, dang, mm -hmm. are you able to even do something like this? But at the same time, it is concerning because it's like, oh my gosh, deep fakes have already been a huge issue. Also. I don't know if it's just me. When I watch it, the videos, like, it's making my skin crawl. <laughs> they look like a little <laughs> creepy. <laughs> I'm like, oh my God. But um, I do think it's a, all of this AI technology too is a good case, in my opinion, for like cryptographic verification, a lot of the stuff that like all, 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 mm -hmm. all of these like SSI um, um, companies, including ours, are working on. We're like, I think I saw a, vid a picture the other day and it was like a scientific diagram, but it was like made by AI completely wrong. And I'm like, this is such a good use case for like, hey, this is verified, like reputable information versus this is not reputable information at all. Exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, right. in a bit for us to confirm that you are also not like, you know, a deep fake uh video simon can you, can you i promise i'm real there, so. i don't have any ssi way to prove it today but maybe in the future yeah please tell us a little bit more about yourself yeah so uh you know i'm your typical tech geek uh you know i started building websites you know in primary school with microsoft front page and and all that stuff and you know i found out it was you know more fun than walking with papers. <laughs> uh, so I, I think I just realized that I really love building things with technology. Mm -hmm. um, so I took like a computer science specialist degree and a master's degree in IT and, um, and business economics. And along the journey, I built a handful of startups and, and exited a few as well. Um, most recently, uh, I've been CTO at one of the largest online travel companies in, in the Nordics. Uh, just before you know, nice. COVID hit, uh, then we took a kind of a rough 
period with, with COVID, uh, everything is fine now, but I also realized that it was time for me to try something, uh, something else. And that's where this journey uh, started. So I just love uh, building products that makes a difference for people. Awesome. Thank you for joining us today. Yeah, I love that. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> I got too excited. I just like that you said you like building product, products that makes a difference for people. But sorry. <laughs> go ahead, Ace. Yeah, I was just going to ask. So um, can you tell us a bit more about Keen? Because like you mentioned, tried it out. And even the website is very interesting to see how you can bond or create, should I put it, contextual, meaningful conversations with AI? Um, yeah, I mean, I can sounds... maybe tell a little bit about the journey that got us to, yeah. to, to Kin. Um, and basically, like, I've been interested in, in blockchain technology since way back. Uh, mostly the technology, not so much, you know, the investment uh, gambling side of things. Um, I mined Litecoin in, like, 2012 in my friend's dorm basement because there was free electricity and stuff like that. Oh, wow. But then it kind of, you know... <laughs> It disappeared a little bit from my, my life, um, but I've been kind of following along. And I think also over the course of my life, you know, I've seen the transition from web one to web two, the rise of, you know, big tech, uh, seeing the wonders of what, you know, the internet enables, but also kind of what it turns into when the incentives are skewed, right? Um, this attention economy that, that we have now. Um, so I think uh, I have a real like passion for uh, for basically like decentralized identity and ownership and stuff yeah. like that. Uh, and I think you know our behavior and our data is super valuable. Um, why is it that we cannot get more of this value ourselves? Why is it only like the big tech giants that can extract this value from us? Um, so, yeah. So that was basically kind of my you know. My values and stuff like that and then two two years ago i got together with uh, my two co-founders today to kind of explore this a little bit uh, explore identity and data ownership um you know this was around the time where web3 was really hyped and we got nfts and we got this notion of digital ownership for the first time which really uh, was incredibly interesting to us uh, so we we're exploring that a lot we we're trying to figure out how can we help people take you know have an actual identity on the internet right because right now we as individual persons we don't really exist on the internet we exist at as you know rows and companies databases but we don't really have our own presence how can we do that and we were looking at nfts and metadata and can we somehow you know put some data into that um, and i think that was when i really uh, or we as a team dug into self-sovereign identity uh, and, you know, we read the Bible, Self-Sovereign Identity by Drummond Reed and Alex uh, Fouchet. Uh, and I, we just fell in love, uh, basically, um, with the vision. I was like, this is, you know, this is what we want to see uh, for the future of the internet. Uh, so how can we do something with that? Um, and, uh, you know, it, it's technology and idea that's been around for a long time. We kind of came a little bit from the blockchain space and we saw kind of the SSI space. And we also saw that it was kind of, you know, merging a little bit, or at least SSI was starting to understand, okay, we can solve some of the challenges with blockchains and stuff like that. And at the same time, we had like the Worldwide Web Consortium with the decentralized identifiers and the verifiable credentials, like going from drafts into an actual recommendation, which is really, really big value happens. So it's like, okay, maybe changes are actually happening on the internet now. Um, so we got really deep into SSI and trying to understand that. Um, we started, you know, I think as most companies with kind of building a wallet that, okay, then we can, you know, take some data. People could connect like the Strava data. And then, you know, you could uh, basically, we could generate real fiber credentials that show that you were really fast when running a 5K uh, run and then you could go to the store and you could show it and then you know they would give you maybe a discount because you could prove that you're a good runner um and we thought like this is this is amazing and everyone could kind of see like the step three four five down the road this is where we have to go but getting that started was just like incredibly difficult it was kind of like a trying to boot a 
three-sided marketplace with uh, new technologies that people didn't really understand and new ways of uh, like sharing data and like why should the runner shop do that and no one really understood it basically so we were uh, like building the technology and the foundations but we didn't really know like how how do we build a product that can you know where we can with that product take people on that journey to become self-sovereign right uh, so that was kind of what we wanted to to do um and then chat gpt came around <laughs> <laughs> um and yeah, it took a few months for us but then we realized that what we have learned and explored in self sovereign identity about the tech and, and and all the things that we built combined with ai was kind of the perfect combination because with ssi we could solve some of the challenges that we saw in ai around trust and verifiability and privacy and at the same time the you know ai or the llm gave us the opportunity to build a product directly with the user where we could give them value um, around their data right they could interact with their data uh, directly so we didn't have like any third parties that we needed to convince we could just build something amazing for the user and that's how we could kind of get them started on this journey um, yeah. and then you know it just uh, started to to take off from there yeah i was just actually gonna ask like with the experience with the with ssi and identity specifically and also you know having a a personal ai i was very curious as to how that journey tied into each other. I mean, you've explained it a little bit, but I mean, it's it's a little bit going from, you know, this is identity, this is what we're trying to solve identity and, oh, you can have your own personal AI and how that, like, are there like more specific, you know, pain points that you address with that, that integration? That's, I think that's going to be yeah. very interesting. Absolutely. So um, basically we started around uh, like April last year with this. Yeah. SSI and AI combination, and we were like trying to, okay, can we get some data in? We were like doing, again, Strava integrations, different integrations, and you could like talk to your data, like ask it, I want to prepare for a run, what can I do, and, and stuff like that. Um, and then, you know, I think everyone really understood how powerful this could be, and also why, you know, privacy and owning the data was important. So started raising money and building a team and all these kind of things. Um, so right now we have, you know, assembled a team of, you know, expert with, with 10 people, experts within machine learning and data and self sovereign identity and app development, and of course, product and marketing and all the other things you have to do and to kind of yeah. make this vision come through. Um, and in December, we launched basically Kin, the, the brand, uh, and the new identity and also the beta, uh, private beta to the first users. Um, so what is Kin? Um, Kin is basically, you know, your personal AI for your private life. And what we really want to do is like help you navigate your own life. So small and big life decisions. Um, it's this combination of, let's say a life coach where you have, you know, some trust in his uh, frameworks that he has to work with and his confidentiality and a combination with the close friend that you might have, which, you know, you can relate to very well, he knows you very well. And then the power of generative AI, where we just have like a lot of knowledge in the LLMs you have, uh, they're always available, right? And they are non-judgmental. So they don't judge you and they are ready anytime you, you want to talk to them. Um, and we are building it with, you know, the principles that, we really uh, and truly believe in, which is SSI and, and data ownership. So it's truly your data uh, and it's also completely private. Um, so, and we think that's really, really important because I think we see into a future where personal AI will be like the most valuable digital asset that everyone will own. Like everyone will have a personal AI in, in, in five, 10 years. Um, and it's going to help them in their life, uh, hopefully make their lives better. And um, we think it's really, really important that, you know, it's not kept in walled gardens. 
it has to kind of transcend ecosystems of Google and Apple and whatever, and it must ultimately be owned and controlled by its user, right? And we think it's one of the most important ideas to to work on this decade. Um, Elon Musk yeah, sounds... was actually out in an interview like a few weeks ago where he kind of explained this as like, "Don't take my friend away from me," right? So <laughs> imagine that you spend five years building your personal AI and it's you know super awesome and you're it's really helping you out in your life. And then because you breach some terms of whatever platform it's on, it's suddenly removed, right? It's gone. And that whole investment, first of all, uh, is, is just gone. And your life just suddenly degrades with whatever, 20%, because it's not there to help you out anymore, right? And we don't want that to happen, basically. I mean, the future, we, sorry, Rizal, I was going to say a future with like personal AI sounds like, you know, future, like, very interesting. <laughs> um, I can imagine having my own Jarvis and all of that stuff. I'm always asking my friends, like, how close are we to having, you know, a Jarvis? Uh, I need to buy a car. Can you do that for me? <laughs> 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 or book it. I mean, we have, we have some of it, like, getting to that point. So it's really interesting to see the boundaries of personal assistance um, in terms of AI. Uh, yeah, and, um, yeah that, that's very... I don't know what the limit is going to be because, like I said, there are some things that you still have to be, like, you know, cautious about with technology and also with ethics. Um, and all of those things, but it's it's a future to dream about. I think. I think yeah. I think it's close. Like I even think even before the five to ten years, we could get there because yeah. we already have like Amazon Alexa and stuff like that, where you can be like Alexa, turn my light <laughs> off, set my alarm. So and now we we just didn't have like this generative AI technology. So yeah. now we'll be able to combine that. And I love that your Simon and his company are thinking about like, hey, why why does these big companies get to own our data. How do we get to own it instead? All right. Why don't we like jump into the demo? Because I think we talked a lot about what Kin is, but like, I think we want to see it. I mean, I've tried, I have it on my phone. I tried it out, <laughs> uh, but let's, let's see it um, happen in real life. Sure. So I recorded this a little bit earlier uh, so I could share with you guys. Uh, so everything is basically like protected and, and encrypted. And you have a chat interface that you're kind of familiar with uh, from, from ChatGPT. Um, here I'm asking you know, a question about what I should ask uh, the community here, or what I should tell about Kin. Um, and basically, through the conversations that you have with Kin, it learns about you, and it's able to use that knowledge uh, as you talk to it. Um, so this is kind of, this is the beta. It's super simple. It's, you know, very raw, uh, but it, it's a showcase of what's coming basically. Um, and all the data lives on your device. Like we cannot see any of the data. Um, so it is, it is private and it is yours. Uh, <laughs> yeah. There we see, go. Has a okay. <laughs> so one of the big things is, is uh, memory. So this is Kin's memory or knowledge about me. So you can see I was a little dot here in the middle, me. And this is uh, all the knowledge it has extracted just from our conversations about me and my life and what's important to me. So here we have, you know, Kin. If I click on Kin, there's, you know, something about the people that are working at Kin and what we're doing and so forth. Um, and I can kind of navigate around. So it's building this, it's called a knowledge graph. It's kind of a, a network of memories and how they relate to each other. Um, and we do that through the conversations, basically. So when you're talking to it, Ken is trying to figure out what's important here about your life that I would like to remember. And it merges it with the existing knowledge. And then when you're having a conversation, we will recognize that, okay, so here is some, now you're talking about your mom. Let's go you know, fetch everything we know about your mom. And oh, well, there's also your dad, which you usually talk about or think about like in your own brain, right? When you think about your mom, you also immediately maybe think about your dad. So we will extract the information that we know about your mom and your dad. We'll bring that into the conversation. So Ken has that knowledge and can actually answer and like be personal. So the whole goal here is to kind of um, give uh, Ken knowledge about you and about your life. And you can kind of go in and you can uh, instruct yeah. uh, something about its behavior. We also have this new feature about personalized reminders that are coming up. So you can kind of um, 
set oh. reminders where Ken will reach out to you um, and ask you questions that are like completely personal. Uh, so it could I see. be, for example, yeah. I was gonna say, I see he also has a sense of humor uh, with the with the GIF. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So it, you know, that was a little fun thing we did. Gave it access to GIF, <laughs> so it can actually use GIFs when it's you know talking to you, which just makes it feel like you're you know chatting to a human being instead of a robot, right? Even though mm. it's it's not, it makes it more fun and engaging. Um, so that's basically uh, what we what we're building here, and I also just wanted to to show you here. So here's some settings about the data control. Uh, so you will see that you know this is the size of your data store. All the data is locally on your device. You have a DID, uh, which means you also have a you know private and a public key that all the data is connected to, and you're in complete control. You can back up your data uh, anytime you want. You can restore it. You, you know it's it's yours basically, yeah. and so we basically don't have any backend servers, right? All the data is on, you know, people's devices. Um, and uh, I think that's, uh, that's a big difference from what we have seen with a lot of other personal AI startups, right? That are um, taking the traditional Web2 centralized approach where, you know, they keep everything in, in, uh, in their databases and somewhere, in that company, someone has the key to the data, right? And yeah. that's what we're talking about with ChatGPT. They use the data to train on. Google was just out here, to, I think it was yesterday, right? About with Gemini, where they said, don't send personal information to us. Don't send any data to us that you would not like, you know, one of our employees to sit and look through because we're doing that, right? Um, and okay. that's just not going to work if you want to build a personal AI. Yeah, talking about data, we have a question from our Discord. Um, mm -hmm. And it basically asks, how does Skin ensure the privacy and security of user data while running all these you know, complex AI models, considering the need for processing large amounts of personal information? And um, a follow-up to that would also, just so they can answer at once, be, what if I change my devices um, since it's stored on my on my local device? What happens to yeah. you know, what he knows about me and stuff like that? And that's, that's a good question. Girl. Uh, that's a great that's a great question so when it comes to the privacy and the data security um, we have this focus on being like local first so that means we try to push push everything to the edge because we believe that um, edge machine learning so already in Apple and modern like Androids there are amazing machine learning chips that can do a lot of stuff um, we are for example running an embeddings model on the device which means we can do vector embeddings in 10 milliseconds instead of 200 milliseconds uh, and the network round trip to open AI, right? So that just enables a lot of things uh, and gives a better uh, user experience. Um, of course, the chips in the phones and devices are not yet strong enough to run the very large language models. Um, so we have this uh, hybrid approach where we try to do as much as we can on the edge. And then for the big models, we run them in uh, in the cloud uh, in a confidential computing environment. Um, and to kind of briefly describe what that is, and that is like on, on modern CPUs, uh, we have had that for, we have some we have something called trusted execution environments. And it's basically an isolated uh, environment on the CPU where you can execute code or programs without the hosts being able to do like a memory dump. So usually if I run a server and I process um, data, uh, the thing with uh, doing confidential or doing a compute on private data is that it's quite challenging. We know how to do like data storage of private data, right? Like um, encryption at rest. We know how to do encryption at uh, in transit, but when it comes to like encryption in compute, uh, it's challenging. Um, and here we have a few different options. You can run everything locally, um, but that's not really viable because we need the big models. Then you have homomorphic encryption, which is super awesome and enables you to do computations without uh, actually like decrypting the data, right? But it's still uh, very early. And before we can actually use that for LLMs, it's probably you know five years or something. Um, and then you have this third option, which is confidential computing. Um, which are these isolated environments that we're kind of used to having with uh, CPUs, but it's a very new thing for GPUs. So it's actually only on 
the latest like H100 uh, from NVIDIA that we at, for the first time have a trust execution environment. Um, so that's what we are working with, uh, with a partnership um, on, on Azure and some other people uh, and figuring out how can we deploy um, machine learning models into these confidential environments such that we can guarantee uh, the privacy and security all the way from your device into the actual uh, machine learning execution and all the way back. Um, so it's, uh, it's tricky and it's hard and it also requires us uh, to be on this journey from um, using the normal closed source models. So right now we still have some uses of um, uh, GPT-4 Turbo. We do it on Azure's uh, OpenAI services platform. So there are some more guarantees around privacy and data security, but it's still not all the way there. Um, so what we are doing and what our head of AI is doing is um, we are looking at all the different tasks that we have for large language models and other mm -hmm. machine learning models. And then we are replacing them with open source models that we can run either on the device or in the confidential uh, uh, GPU environment in, in the cloud. I hope this... that was answer enough. I have to dive more into it. No, that was yeah. good. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I think that was good. Um... I don't think and then around the, the, yeah. the question around the uh, yeah, multiple devices. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's a good question. And we are um, exploring different options here. Hey, One of I the, think you should highlight it so that people know what we're talking oh, about. Yeah. yeah, hold on. So, no, so one I, of I, the, I asked that. Oh, you asked that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay, there we go. <laughs> uh, no, one of the options is, of course, the decentralized web nodes that you guys are building, right? Um, because that's an amazing way to give people a personal data store where they mm -hmm. can store the data and they can kind of, uh, you can connect to it. So, so right now actually on, um, in our app, you have a local version of the decentralized web node. Yeah. And then the idea is to give everyone a cloud version of the decentralized web node. And then when you go on your other device, it will be able to synchronize the data from that, right? So you can think of it as kind of a mesh network that is syncing the data uh, between your devices and all the data is encrypted to your private key. So even though it's synced through a server in the cloud, all that data is actually encrypted with, you know, your private yeah. public key pair, right? Um, so it's only on your device that the data can actually be read. That makes sense. I was going to ask already, like, where does the memory get stored? But I guess you just answered that, like, stored, um, the memory for the AI is stored in the decentralized web node on your local device. Yeah, everything is on the local device right now. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, we have a question from Discord as well. Um, it says, if you wanted to ingest, say, all of the activities to Kim, is there some sort of import facility? Yeah, and that's, that's, a good, that's a really good question. And it's something that we have been thinking about a lot. Um, our focus has been around what we call soft data. So maybe I have to explain that a little bit. Uh, so um, there is hard data and there is soft data. Hard data is all the facts and the data points that you know exists out there. Uh, so that would be your tweets or you know your Apple Health, your calendar, and your emails and all these um, artifacts, right? That that live out there, um, and that of course uh, tells a lot about who we are. But it's, it all starts somewhere else. It, it all really starts with the soft data, which is what is inside your head, your values, your thoughts, your uh, relationships with people and how you approach life. So what we want to be really good at to begin with is extracting and using this soft data. Because if we build up a foundation where Kin truly gets to know you, who you are and what you do based on this, then it will be much easier for us to add external data sources and know how to actually interpret these data sources, right? Because let's say you add, um, you want to tell Kin about an article. Well, it's, it's great and we might like want to summarize the article so we know a little bit about it. But what's actually really important is what you think about that article. Um, why are you telling Kin about that article? Is it because you know you really like this idea or this idea and this idea, right? So that's that's what we are focusing on a lot. But external um, data is definitely you know on the product roadmap, uh, and we see a lot of 
you know, personal AI companies that are you know, jumping out to do a lot of data integrations. And then you can talk to your email, you can talk to your whatever Twitter and you can post a tweet and all these kind of things. Yeah. And it demos really well on you know, uh, Twitter or whatever. Um, but we think that we have to start on a step you know, below and actually try to understand the person because if you don't understand the person, you don't understand what they want when they say, can you help me book a restaurant, right? Okay, what do you wanna know about the person? You wanna know what they like, you wanna know where they live, you wanna know what restaurants they have eaten at before, uh, all these kind of things, right? Um, so that's where we start and then we move into actually, you know, taking in other data sources. That's a cool um, thought to get good at the soft data. That makes sense because sometimes um, with tools like ChatGPT, right? I'm like, oh, help me brainstorm this. And then like all the brainstorming it does, I'm like, I would never do this. Um, this is not like something within my personality or something I would even be capable of doing. So I, I like that yeah. approach. I, I'm excited for when y'all can be able to embed tweet or, or integrate getting tweets. Cause I feel like that has a lot of, soft data in there about myself i don't know <laughs> yeah 100 100 percent, and we really you really we really want to do that um but it, it's been very important for us to focus on kind of the memory component and i don't know if you saw like chat gpt just released uh, their memory um Ooh, probably because there's a lot of you know there's a lot of demand out there for for memory but yeah um what they released is basically you know like a bullet list you can add you know this and that and, and, and so on, which is, I think it's a little bit, uh, uh, a simple solution. Um, yeah. and, uh, this is really where we kind of differentiate us. We're focusing a lot on the long-term memory. So yeah. what I just showed you in the demo is what you can think of as if you kind of try to map it to the human brain a little bit, uh, you have something called semantic memory, which is about facts and relationships and all these kind of things and that's more or less what you see in this graph there's like simon he works here he thinks this about that and so on um but what we're working with right now is kind of the other side of things which is um what we call episodic memory and episodic memory is about events that are happening in your life kind of mm -hmm. things that are anchored to time so that could be you know that you went to the park this weekend with Sarah and it was so fun because, you know, her dog played in the water fountain, or it could be that you, you know, uh, are feeling bad today. All these kind of things that are kind of, you know, really describes your life. We want to be able to recognize that and kind of anchor it to a timeline so that Kin also gets this understanding about you know, how your life is evolving, right? And can be there for you in the situations where you need it. Um, gotcha. And with these two types of memories, Kin will really be able to kind of yeah, understand what's going on in your life, basically. Gotcha. So it's kind of on a growth journey with you. So, um, like, I'm before I, I go back to these questions, I am curious. I, I think you mentioned it a little bit, but like, oh, okay, you just said the memory is getting stored in your DWN, but how does it make those like little like graph connections? Is that through the vector embeddings? Cause I, when I like downloaded it, it was like, Rizelle has a best friend, da, da, da. Like, how does it like separate out everything that's happening? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so basically we are uh, analyzing the conversations as they flow and we try to recognize uh, Rizelle has a friend called Sarah, for example. Then we will take that new knowledge and we will send it into a custom model that we built actually. So we fine tuned a, a, a large language model um, built on Mistral 7B, but with our own data set. And what it does is basically that it takes in this new knowledge that we have you know, recognized from the chat or what we think is new knowledge. And then we query this graph that already exists. And we kind of take a subgraph, the relevant subgraph that might be related to that thing. Then we give it to the LLM, to the model, and it outputs graph operations. So that's something like add node, add edge, remove node, remove edge. And then we apply those to the graph. And in that way, the memory evolves as you speak and interact with Kin, basically. Love it. All right. I have 
I'm going to ask the questions that are coming in from Discord, but I have more of my own. I hope they don't take up too much time. <laughs> um, so one of the questions that um, Ace, Ace brought in here from, from the Discord was, how large can our local DWN be? And also, do you leverage RDF graph? RDF like graphs and how do you represent them in DWN message? Great questions and uh, technical question as well. So how large can your local DWN be? Uh, I think we have uh, phones with quite a lot of storage. So okay. as long as we're talking about text mostly, um, we can store quite a lot of data. Obviously, if we get into images and videos and other types of media, we have to consider that maybe there is some um selective synchronization or things like that um idf like graphs we actually don't uh we have an option to export the graph uh, as an idf uh, graph actually uh, but right now it's only kind of for internal use um and that also kind of comes into how we represent them in a dvn message so if you're familiar with the dvn it's mm -hmm. built around uh, schemas and protocols Okay. that are kind of like JSON schemas, right? To kind of define, this is my object. Um, the challenge you can say um, with that uh, is if you wanna do very like advanced queries on top of your data, which we wanna do. So we have together, we see the DVN as kind of a, you know, a raw data storage. And then on top of the DVN, we have built um, an indexing layer. So we have another local database that indexes all of the data. That's where the vector embeddings are stored. That's, you know, it, this database also support like graph operations. So we can query it. We can do like nearest neighbors stuff. We can do vector searches and stuff like that. And then we can store, you know, some of the raw data uh, in the DVN. That's, I hope that makes sense. No, that made a lot of sense. And like, even just like, I think my understanding is like the your DWN is going to be as big as whatever your your phone storage would be, and if but if you get into like videos and images and stuff like that, you'll have to like think about it more. This is an interesting question, um, and somebody's asking about like what can ever be integrated with IoT devices in a home or office environment. I like this because it could be like. With, like what I was mentioning with Alexa, where it's yeah. like, oh, Alexa, open this or oh, set your reminder. But now Kim knows you're always going to want to open your your blinds at 9 a.m. or whatever, something like that. Yeah, I mean, for sure. Uh, it's, it's, it's just a matter of time and uh, data integrations is on our roadmap. We just have to figure out what data integrations brings the most value to Kin in the way of uh, getting to know you better as a person, because that's our goal number one. And then, mm -hmm. you know, further down the line, we're definitely you know, going to see this world where agents are actually also taking actions on, on your behalf, right? And, you know, it would probably be quite simple to integrate with some, you know, Google Home or something like that. So it will be able to actually trigger some different actions at, at certain times. Um, yeah. Uh, that's definitely, I, I really like, definitely going to happen. Yeah, I was going to say I really like that question because when you think about like Google Home and other assistants right now, they, they already can, you know, carry out actions on your behalf. Uh, but for the most part, it feels like, you know, you're dictating an instruction or you're, you know, setting a, an action to take at a later time. Um, but if, if yes. picturing a world where, you know, there's this personal AI and you start to have conversations, like an actual conversation with Google Home is like, Oh, I want to do this. Like, oh, you know, you have to do this. Don't do this that way. Like, it just starts to feel more personal. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Ex ex exactly. Just, and, uh, exactly. To totally. And for, for us, this is one of the next steps. So we have a lot of kind of on the roadmap, right? One of the things mm -hmm. that these personalized reminders, which is kind of a, a first step. Very soon, we will, um, Kin will, as Kin gets to know you, it will also be able to kind of suggest you to do things, right? Um, so we want to make it more proactive. So let's say that you want to be a better boyfriend, then that it might know that this is one of the values that you're working on. Okay. Then if it knows that Valentine's day is coming up, it might like suggest you, maybe you should, you know, book a table at a restaurant or something like that. Right. I like so the it can actually suggest. not just do kind of 
what you're telling it to do, but also based on all this knowledge it has, it will actually be able to suggest um, yeah. based on where you are in your life right now, what would be you know appropriate to do and suggestions and keep you accountable for things that you might want to do, but uh, might not be doing. I actually have a question. I hope it's not too intrusive, but I'm curious about your business model because, mm -hmm. um, I, I mean, a lot of people ask this when I've talked about like web five DWNs on like live streams, they're like, why would a company move to this? How would they make money off of this? Cause I know right now with other AI companies, they're, it's free to us, but they're selling our data. And then if you want more or have like an increased experience, and then you pay a little bit more. But for you, is it like to be able to access this, people have to eventually pay after it's out of beta mode or what's the value it's gonna to bring to you? Cause after all, you are a business. That's completely true. And uh, it will be a model where people have to pay us because we cannot monetize the data because we don't have it. And uh, so it's, it's very simple and uh, it might seem a little bit scary if you are Meta or Facebook, um, but we actually think that you can build a product where you provide enough value that people want to pay for it. It's actually quite simple. Um, but I think, what, and I think that comes back to, to, to maybe some of the general things when you're talking about adoption and of, you know, data sovereignty, right? Because, um, sometimes you get the feeling that like consumers or people don't really care about that. And I think that's in a way true, like only few key people care about privacy just for the sake of privacy. Um, few people care about data sovereignty just for the sake of data sovereignty. Um, in the end, it's really all about the value and the utility that you get from being in control of your data. So, you know, we have tons of wallets out there where you can kind of connect data and have some data in it, but most of them are empty and they're boring and, you know, they're of no use. Right. Um, so you might have very strong ideologies and principles, but if you don't build a product that people want to use, um, then what does it matter? Right. Um, we want to take, then, then you're just left with like, then you don't give people an alternative at all then they're just stuck with what they have now, right? So it's this bridge that you have to do. You can't go 100% all in and make it super tricky and difficult and make people store private keys under their pillows and do a lot of technical stuff because then they're not going to move there ever. So we need to bridge the gap, right? So we can get people on that journey. Um, and that's what we are very focused on. So we don't want to like compromise on, on convenience, but we also want to make sure that uh, we are um, really uh, doing things the right way um, when it comes to privacy and security and data ownership. But we want to do it on your behalf so you don't have to care about it. We will care about it for you. I love that. Sounds that. good. Yeah, I love that. And I think... oh, what was I was it? checking if I have any more questions from Discord. <laughs> oh, gotcha. Let me know if we have more. I was just going to comment. I think that sounds really similar to what a lot of other guests have said that have come on um, this stream. When they talked about like the usability, like you don't want to make this be something that people don't want to use or is seeming like really technically overwhelming because then that'll reduce the chance of adoption. Um, and I actually, I mean, this is not really on the, the list of things we were going to talk about, but I just have a random, another random question. Uh, I was like, I mean, if you don't know, you don't know, whatever. But um, I was like reading this blog post and it was called like the three wallet problem. And it was talking about how like in this, in like this SSI industry, we're telling people like install this wallet and now this wallet and now this wallet. And we're like, we're actually this is actually not a good experience for people because now they're just going to have a million wallets to like prove their identity and be able to get access to these things. And although this is not necessarily related to Kin, but I know you're really mm -hmm. like embedded into this industry. I'm curious of your thoughts on that. I completely agree. And there's uh, there's wallets everywhere and um, people are just going to use what's convenient. They're not going to choose a wallet over another wallet because, you know, whatever. Uh, I, I think honestly, the best wallet 
is the wallet that people don't really know what they have. So when you sign up to Kin, you actually get a wallet, right? You get a wallet that can hold, you know, you have a DID, it can hold verifiable credentials. It could even hold crypto if you wanted to, right? Um, but that's not the, the point of this. And that might, that will enable us to do some amazing things later because I think we're looking into a future where it's gonna become like very, very important. But for now, and for the stage our product is in now, it's not important. The important thing is that it's built in and we are ready to unlock that future. Um, so I think it was your own like example earlier, like proving uh, something right with verifiable credentials. So mm -hmm. imagine that we have this future where agents are actually um, acting on our behalf, right? Let's say, you know, you tell it to go to a restaurant and book a table. Okay, well, the restaurant owner will want to know that that AI agent that is now trying to book a table is actually, there's a human being behind that, right? It's not just like, like some rogue AI agent that is out and booking a thousand tables at once. Um, so, and how do you prove that, right? Well, that's where, you know, you can take your DID, you can create a verifiable credential, you can let your agent present that verifiable credential to the restaurant so the restaurant can prove, okay, this is actually Simon that is booking, it not, it's not just some random AI agent, right? Um, and that's how we can like bring trust into these AI interactions. Uh, and I think that's going to be key in a future where it's inevitably going to be AI agents talking to other AI agents and businesses and other persons. I love that. I love that you said that, especially the trust part. I think when I initially um, posted about this stream, there was one comment that they were like, you can never trust AI because you don't know what the the output would be, but I don't think that's what you meant when you say trust or what I meant either. It was more like, I trust that this a this AI is acting on behalf of this person. I trust that my data is not being shared with other people, right? Yeah, or ex exactly. And of, we want to enable data sharing because data really gets value when you can share it. But oh. the, the important thing is that you're in control. So, oh, um, I think when you imagine that, you know, you spend a year or two building up your kin, it knows a lot about you. That is actually really, really powerful and valuable. And in order for you to then start getting some value out in the world of this data, you can imagine a scenario where let's say you're going to your psychiatrist every second week and the psychiatrist will ask your AI agent to prepare a little summary about what happened in your life over the past two weeks? Like what physical activities did you do? Maybe did you have any like important conversations and stuff like that? And it can send a re request to you know your kin and you will be able to kind of, it will prepare that email for you and you will be able to share it. But it could also be, you know, you're visiting an e-commerce website, shopping for some new clothes. And that website might ask your AI agent so what style do you like, you know, what are, you know, what clothes <laughs> did you buy last time? What are your sizes and these kind of things? And you can just approve, yeah, the AI agent can um, share that data for you, right? And what's really powerful is that with the LLM, we can have this schema agnostic sharing. So mm -hmm. basically you can request the data in natural language and you can just describe the format that you want the data in. So the psychiatrist yes. might want it in an email, but the website wanted in some specific JSON structure that they can easily pass and use, right? And that's how we enable, um, like that's how owning and controlling your own data suddenly becomes like extremely valuable. And I think more than we have ever seen before. And that will be a, a big incentive to actually own and control your own data. That, that sounds is, amazing. Yeah, I'm gonna clip that. Like I'm <laughs> gonna clip from that because that was really good. And I think it was it, like just the way you described it, it's a good way to like em envision the future. And I don't know, yeah, I'm either gonna become really lazy or really <laughs> <laughs> like, AI do it for me. I'm not doing it. Um, before yeah. we, oh go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna ask. I mean, it's very nice to dream and imagine and you know try to build the future. Uh, but right now, Kin is in beta, and I wanted to ask, because you've already started touching about it, but like for this year, for example, which is more short term mm -hmm. and a bit long term, um, what are you looking forward to, you know, bringing into Kin and what are the, like, the next steps? 
Oh, so many things. Uh, so first of all, you know, we have our uh, private beta. I think there's around a thousand users now that are engaging and using it. We have a, a Discord that uh, we're getting a lot of feedback. So right now it's a lot about learning how people are using it and making the product, mm -hmm. you know, better. Um, one of the big things that's coming up are these personalized reminders. So that's super, super cool. Um, then we have this whole episodic memory thing that I talked about, which is going to give Kim this ability to understand your life much better. And then I think one of the most requested features is voice. And uh, so you can actually talk to Kim. Um, and that's definitely coming. Our uh, Luckily, we have like Christopher Shelby. He's our head of AI. He's been building um, uh, Samsung's Bixby, their AI assistant. And he has a, a, a PhD in, in uh, text-to-speech and has built um, your TTS, which is actually one of the baseline models that are, that are used today for comparison. So we have an expert in the field and we are excited to um, really build some amazing voice features. Yeah. I'm and then of course fun. also, yeah, multi-device is also a big thing. So that's also going to be this year. So we're going to be busy. <laughs> yeah. Sounds like it. <laughs> I'm super excited because I have I have been using it and I know the the example you gave of like talking to your psychiatrist it sounds silly but I kind of was using ChatGPT like before therapy I would be like writing out all my stuff because sometimes I'll go to therapy and they're like what's going on with your week and I'm like I don't know nothing so I would just like write it down in ChatGPT I'm like put put a summary so I could just say it to my therapist so I'm like I'm gonna switch to Kin and try it out to see how that works. And I like the idea yeah. of voice. I'm curious how y'all will handle like different accents and all that. Cause I know like, like my, <laughs> <laughs> not anybody. I mean, even sometimes yeah, I, know. I, guess I have an American accent, but sometimes I'm like, man, it's not typing anything I said. <laughs> all right. Um, yeah. yeah. That, I think, that's that's I think for sure is... a challenge, but uh, there's a yeah. there's a lot of great work being done on that and you know yeah chris as i mentioned he, he did a paper on like zero shot multilingual tts so that basically means you can take you know, your voice uh, or any voice and then turn it into another language and you can also do the same thing with accents for example um so you would be able to kind of we will be able to hopefully create a kin voice that is very unique but hopefully you will also be able to um, personalize it so it's to your liking basically I would so I would pay for this. Any any last question before I transition to the other um, questions? I mean, I have something to say. Not necessarily a question. It's more like a, a general observation. Because when it comes to voice, for example, I don't know if you. I mean, you probably also the human API device, you know, to sleep to your chest. And I've always thought about stuff in the direction where I could be walking, you know, going on a run or in the shower or just you know thinking by myself. And I'm having all these thoughts and I want, I don't want to like pick up a pen and start writing it out. I don't want to like, you know, what's it called? Turn on the camera and record myself. Um, but imagine just being able to say things like, oh, I'm thinking about like, it just feels very natural and you're expressing it, you're thinking. And there is something that just captures this in a secure way, obviously without like invading or using your data to sell you stuff uh, and being able to okay. keep that, keep that in check. You can go back to it later. Uh, there are times where I give a whole, you know, like, presentation just walking on the street. I, I could be thinking about a topic and I give an entire presentation or I record a YouTube video without any camera and there's nothing yeah. to you know, capture that voice or that recording or or be smart enough to process it. I think that is one thing that would I, I'm, I'm looking for I completely to agree. I completely agree. Like my my uh, what I want to do is like when I'm biking home from work, I just want to talk to Ken and describe what happened today and kind of just do a little <laughs> journaling brain dump style right, kind of thing exactly. and just tell it about what happened right just to keep <laughs> it in the loop and because i know how valuable that will be um that it gets to know me right but i also yeah. have to say that journaling traditional journaling for example i love the idea of it but i never <laughs> really got into it um, same <laughs> same um I'm excited to to capture my shower thoughts. Just like, <laughs> I mean, have it. I'm like, this is a perfect conference talk. And then I come out the shower and I'm like, I forgot it. <laughs> All right.
So I do want to remind people, you know, go ahead and check out mykin.ai. It's in beta right now, but um, I requested to join and got, got like accepted pretty quickly. I having a good time. It's just asking me about myself. I guess it's learning me. Um, <laughs> I think it's pretty cool. So definitely yeah. check that out. Any place else that people should check you out, Simon, before I ask you these other questions? Yeah, for sure. Go to the website and, and, and sign up. You will get access, I think, more or less immediately, as you said, right now. Yeah. Um, we also have a Discord where uh, we have around, I think, seven 800 people that are talking about AI and personal AI stuff. So definitely come in and just be brutal, honest with you. What do you like? What do you not like? We are totally open for all types of discussions and we just want to have your feedback. That's how we get better. Yes. And I also want to plug your blog. Like I was yes. reading it and it's pretty mm -hmm. interesting. Like y'all got some deep thoughts. So blog <laughs> yeah. definitely if you're into like the more, uh, if you want to understand, for example, how we approach privacy, there's a whole um, kind of four article series on the road to privacy, where we kind of describe why it's important for personal AI and mm -hmm. the different approaches you can take. And than how we are approaching it. So that will give you a lot of food for thoughts, I think. Yeah, I agree. All right, I, with, the, with just the three minutes left, I'm gonna ask some of like, just the fun little questions just to get to know you. <laughs> so first question is, what's your favorite food? Yeah, this is a little bit embarrassing actually, because it's, it's called Mexican lasagna in my family. So it's like lasagna, but with tortillas instead of pasta and you know with chicken it's my dad's recipe Whoa. and it has zero to do with actual real mexican food which i also <laughs> love uh, but i guess you know it's just something you get used to when you grow up with it it's that like, sounds exciting yeah i know right <laughs> family meal i like any kind of lasagna so that was good <laughs> I, have a, I have a very funny story about lasagna Ooh. the first time i would hear about them was through this um movie garfield so it's like oh lasagna i'm like I need to eat this someday. <laughs> I to eat. <laughs> and I finally did, and it was, it was worth it. It was, it was, it was, it was worth it? it, was, it was, oh, was I thought good. you were going to, you were, you had your expectations. No, it, it was right there. It was okay. right there. I feel knows right what's there. good, that's for sure. <laughs> it was right there. Any mixture of like grain sauce and cheese is bomb. Okay. <laughs> what will your superpower be if you could, or if you could have any superpower, what would it be? I think, well, the superpower that I dream about when I'm, yeah, dreaming is flying around. So I think it would be that, like, just be able to fly. That would that be cool? Uh, yeah, hundred oh, percent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's that's <laughs> like definitely a, a perfect one. But I'm like, my number one is teleportation. I would just love to be like, Boop. I wonder if that's Ken should good. do that one day. Ken, bring. <laughs> <laughs> That would be cool. <laughs> All right. And then last but not least, what's your favorite Beyonce song? Yeah, this one is really difficult. I really, I'm actually, I love a lot of music, but I don't really follow specific artists a lot. So I had to go all the way, way back to kind of Destiny's Child period and Survivor. I think I, have, I grew up with that song and I think it's, uh, it's very fitting for a startup. So uh, 100% Survivor. <laughs> I like that. I'm a survivor. That is pretty for a startup. Because <laughs> you're just trying to um, live and make sure you get to be a scale up eventually. Um, Absolutely. This was, <laughs> this was really great and interesting. I'm excited for like the further improvements of Kin. Like mm -hmm. I want to keep trying it out. And if in the future you ever have like this cool update on kin and you want to return definitely feel free to reach out and also thanks to the audience y'all always ask really like interesting questions like y'all are yeah, really good questions yeah yeah i love it um and oh well last thing to let y'all know there's not going to be a twitch stream next week but there will be a discord community showcase um with another employee from kin who's going to talk about his thoughts on ai or I think he is, it's his thoughts on AI and, and privacy and all that. Um, so if there's nothing else, well, do y'all have anything else you want to say before? No, thank you, everybody. Just thank you, thank for, you for, for bringing me on and for everyone listening. It was a pleasure to talk about Ken. And thank I hope you for joining us, Simon. Yeah.
right. Bye, y'all. All right. Bye, everyone. Bye.